Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to part 1 season 1 of what if Deku could use 100% of one for all. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. Now into today's video, which is what if Izuku was able to use one for all at 100% from the start, without breaking his bones part 1. The change that is being made, is in this version of events one for all doesn't backlash the user's body, but they still have to train to be able to use it at 100%. So to begin things would go pretty much as they went in the anime, up until the entrance exam. The reason All Might would have Izuku train for the months before the exam is because he wouldn't want Izuku to become reliant on one for all, and so that he would train his body to use it at 100%. Now that he is physically capable of using it at 100%, All Might transfers the quirk to him and like in the anime, Izuku doesn't feel any different. Izuku goes through and does the theory test for entrance exam. He does about as well as he did in the anime. And then it's on to the practical test. Everything is the same up until he needs to rescue Achako. Izuku would leap up not holding anything back. A sonic boom is heard as he breaks the sound barrier. Windows shatter and a crater is formed where he jumped from. Glass is falling down on people. Izuku throws his punch. And when he does he wipes out everything on that side of the city. That whole area is gone. Thankfully there are no students over there. Izuku did manage to destroy quite a few robots that were over on that side of the city. Izuku lands without a scratch on him. He powers up his legs so he doesn't take the full force of the landing. No one is moving, they're just all looking at him. Some are saying how strong is that guy. That was just one punch. A few give up there, while the others try to score a few more points before time runs out. Izuku just stands there looking at what he just did. Izuku, was that me just now? He looks at his own hands. Izuku, whoa. This is the power of all might. It's amazing, but also kinda scary. Time is up. Izuku goes home, and waits for a letter to come. He feels like he did alright on both tests, as he saw his punch wipe out a large amount of the robots. He is just thankful that he didn't hurt anyone. Izuku knows that he needs to learn to control this power. After a few days he gets the letter telling him that he was accepted. He is pleasantly surprised that All Might is going to be a teacher at UA. First day of UA. Izuku shows up to class and Bakugo is just as annoyed as he was at the start of the anime. As Izuku walks to his desk everyone who took the same practical as him stares at him and watches him sit down. Izuku feels pretty awkward from this. A minute or two goes by and Eraser Head enters. He takes his time goes through the entrance scores. Bakugo gets a bit annoyed that Deku was so high up. Eraser Head takes them down to do the series of physical tests. Izuku doesn't use his quirk on any of them as he still doesn't have good control over his quirk. Until the last event, he throws the ball into the air by only using his finger. It goes further than nearly any other person's. The only one who beat his was Achko. The ball went for several kilometers. When all the tests were over Izuku was third from the bottom. The only two below him being the invisible girl and then at the bottom, Moneta. Izuku went home that day and spent the next few weekends trying to get good control over his quirk. At the moment he is finding it hard to power up into it and then control how much he is using. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up? Mortals welcome to part 2 season 2 of what if Deku could use 100%. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. Now into today's video, which is what if Izuku could use 100% without breaking his bones, part 2. The change that is being made, is in this version of events one for all doesn't backlash the user's body. Izuku's had a bit of time to practice controlling his quirk. He cannot really control the percentage output, but he can control where exactly he is using his quirk. A few days have gone by, by this point and when he gets to school he does his normal school subjects. Then in the afternoon it's hero training. Today's hero training is a teamed activity. The teams are chosen at random. First group is Izuku and Achako versus Ada and Bakugo. Now a quick note. Bakugo has not seen one of Izuku's full power punches. If he had I'm sure if had these events would have gone differently. Bakugo and Ada are playing the villains, while Izuku and Achako are playing the heroes. Izuku and Achako make a plan. Izuku knows that Bakugo will most likely go after him. Izuku also knows that using his quirk on Bakugo it would likely kill him. When Deku and Achako enter the building, Bakugo comes right at them with explosions. He is aiming to take Deku down. At the very start of this Bakugo asked Ada if Deku really had a quirk. Ada told him yeah it destroyed a large amount of the city. Bakugo doesn't believe that little Deku has that much power and goes down to attack him. 
while Bakugo is attacking and chasing Deku around. Deku is trying to think of a way to fight Bakugo. Nothing he does works well against him. Bakugo is now adapting and changing his fighting style so that Deku cannot counter him. They eventually find themselves in the same situation as in the anime. Deku powers up only the tip of his pinky. It twitches creating a shockwave more powerful than that of the one in the anime. The pressure from the twitch also creates a sideways shockwave slamming Bakugo into a wall knocked out. A few hours later Bakugo wakes up not remembering what happened in class that day. All Might is standing at the base of the bed. He tells Bakugo that he will inform him another time. For now, he should go home and get some rest. Bakugo goes home. And that night he dreams of what happened. He sees Izuku all buff like All Might and he sees himself with a second place medal. Izuku feels really bad for what he did to Bakugo. He thought he would just be able to send the attack up. He didn't account for any sideways pressure. Izuku is extremely worried about using his quirk on someone. He has to learn to control it and soon. He just about killed Bakugo. Class goes as usual for the next few weeks. Izuku is able to control his output slightly better. He mainly trains being able to power up and into it. Then tries to keep the power up active while decreasing the amount he is using. It's finally time for the USJ. The class suits up and heads out. Izuku is in a makeshift suit as his keeps tearing apart at the slightest use of his quirk. The class takes the bus to the USJ. Thirteen begins to explain what they will be doing there. The racer head is standing to the side. All Might seems to be running late. Just then they see a portal open. Dozens walk out. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals welcome to Season 1 Part 3 of What If Deku Had 100% of One for All. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. Where we left of last time the USJ incident has just begun. A large group of villains has teleported in through the warp gate quirk. The students of one are questioning where they came from and why the alarms aren't going off. Thirteen and Eraser Head discuss and agree that getting the students out of here is the best course of action. The students begin to rush towards the exit, while Eraser Head goes and attacks the villains to hold them off. Thirteen stays close to the students to defend them. Just then a purple and black portal opens and the students are split up just like in the anime. This time however when Izuku is stuck under the water with the villains, he would get ready to throw a punch, but before he can sue grabs him and Minda and gets them out of there. From the boat, Izuku thinks of the best way to try to take out the villains. Izuku would decide that the best way would be to get the others away. So he grabs onto Minta and Sue and jumps over to land. He lands creating a crater. When he jumped a massive wave was pulled from behind him as he moved at his top speed towards the land. The ship that he jumped from explodes from the force that he applied to it. As he looks at the massive wave that is coming towards them, he quickly gets ready to throw a punch. He yells Detroit Smash as he throws a controlled 5% smash that rips apart that whole area. Thankfully the villains were towards the side enough that the sheer pressure from the punch didn't pancake them on impact. Suddenly a massive black figure appears in front of the three students. Minda is terrified. Sue is in shock and Izuku is worried. The black figure just stands there as a portal opens and the leader walks through. The leader says, Namu kill these three. Izuku instinctively moves activating one for all in his legs and arm. He vanishes and moves over towards the Namu faster than the eye can see, faster than even the Namu can react. He hits the Namu with 100% of his power. This Namu that was designed to fight a weaker All Might is hit by an Izuku who is just as strong as All Might in his prime. The punch hits the Namu, and nothing. The Namu barely flinches. A look of pure fear goes over Izuku's face. Izuku says no. I hit him with everything I had, and it still wasn't enough. Deku begins to back up as the Namu goes to swat him. It's at this point that Ida escapes to go get the heroes. Meanwhile back with Deku, he focuses one for all, all throughout his body to try and block the hit. The Namu hits him and Deku is sent flying into the wall. He just lays there unconscious. The leader laughs and says, there goes the mini boss, now to just kill the trash. Minda out of fear starts throwing sticky balls at the Namu. The Namu just lets them hit him as he moves towards the two. Sue grabs Minta and tries to jump away, but the Namu grabs her leg and pulls them down slamming them into the ground. The Namu then goes in to finish them off when the doors open. All Might has arrived. All Might quickly speed blitzes the villains on his way over to the students. The students notice something. All Might. He isn't smiling. All Might works his way to Minta and Sue over the course of about five seconds. He leaves behind an area filled with unconscious villains. Izuku begins to wake up. 
All Might says to the students it will be all right now, because I am here. This causes the students to get goosebumps. Shijiraki says looks like we finally triggered the boss event. Namu, Korijiri. Finish this. The Namu jumps at All Might to attack him. The Namu throws a punch and All Might clashes it with his own. The Namu and All Might begin to move at super speed, blitz punching each other, causing massive waves of wind to push people back. Shijiraki goes around the side to grab Maita. All Might sees this out of the corner of his eye and tries to stop him. But when he turns away from the Namu, the Namu grabs him and attempts to grab onto him. The Namu manages to grab him in his wound. This causes All Might to be slowed down just enough for Shijiraki to get a hold of the student. However, he keeps one finger off Su, just so that he can use her as a meat shield. The Namu keeps All Might busy so that he cannot try to free the student. However, it's at this moment that All Might hears someone yell from the depths of his heart. Almighty, smash. All Might turns to see Izuku jumping at the Namu hitting it with more than 100% of his power, sending the Namu flying back a few meters. It's in this time that All Might quickly moves to save Su, grabbing her and knocking out Shijiraki in an instant. He then puts her down with the other students just in time to get back and block the Namu, who was about to hit Izuku. Izuku is shocked to see All Might standing there, blocking the punch from the Namu. That was reckless young Midoriya. Thank you. All Might then overpowers the Namu by using more than 100% of his own power. All Might sends the Namu flying through the roof. Kork Jiri manages to get away, but he fails to bring Shijiraki with him. The other pro heroes arrive just in time to cover up All Might's weak form. It's at this point in time that Izuku notices that he broke his arm when he threw that punch. Izuku is taken to the medical room and his arm is treated. The racer head is also treated and the other heroes manage to take Shijiraki into custody. Anyway that's it for this video. I'm adding a new thing that I do at the end of each video and explain my reasoning behind certain events. Now to begin with, how did Izuku break his arm? I thought one for all had no recoil. Well, it has no recoil at 100%. Going beyond that still has drawbacks. That's what broke his arm. However, it's not as badly broken as in the series. It's only a slight fracture, since Deku used one for all. All throughout his body does that mean he will have full cow from now on? No it doesn't. He used that accidentally. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Part 4 Season 1. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. We left off from when Deku was at the Usch fighting the Namu with All Might. Izuku was getting ready to go to class. A couple of days have passed since the USJ incident. The school wanted to give the students time to recover. Midoriya's arm was already healed by Recovery Girl the day of the USJ. Midoriya gets to class seeing that the USJ incident is still on the news and that the police and press have been questioning Shigaraki. And he was sent to Tartarus prison. Midori arrives in class. His classmates are talking about the attack too and Kaminari mentions that they feel like celebrity. To which Jiru says, Get over yourself, they are only interested in the hero course being attacked. Aizawa comes in the class saying, Good morning everybody. I hope you are all ready because your fight isn't over yet. The whole class is worried. They wonder if more villains are going to attack. Aizawa then elaborates, We are going to start training for the sports festival. A rare opportunity to get scouted by pro heroes all over the country. That will only come three times in your lifetime. After class Midoriya, Achako and Ida have a conversation on why they want to be heroes. After Achako tells her reason for wanting to be a hero Midoriya thinks she is the most grounded out of all of them. The three are going to go to lunch but All Might comes and asks Midoriya if he wants to have lunch with him. Midoriya goes have lunch with Midoriya. And they have a conversation about how Midoriya is improving with his use of one for all. All Might mentions that the Spots Festival is coming up soon and Midoriya need to present himself proudly to the world and say, I am here. The next few days the whole class spends training for the Sports Festival. While everybody else focuses on training their quirks Midoriya just spends his time trying to improve his control of one for all. The day before the Sports Festival when the students are going home they find a crowd of people in front of their class blocking the exit. Bakugou threatens them and he leaves. Shinsu comes by and says that they may be taking the spot of people in the sports festival if they do well enough. The day of the sports festival arrives and before it starts Todoroki declares war on Midoriya saying, You have the NR1 hero in your corner, as the son of the NR2 hero I will defeat you. Midoriya nods and says, Well Todoroki, everybody including all the other departments are giving it their all and I won't be doing any less than them. I am going to win Todoroki. 
They go to the arena and in the inauguration Bakugu is asked to say a few words. He says, I just want to say I'm going to win. To the backlash of everyone who isn't in the sports festival, the first event is announced and it's a 4 kilometers race around the stadium. Everybody gets ready because the race is about to start. Present Mike counts down. 3, 2, 1 begin. Everybody starts running and Present Mike asks Aizawa. What do you think is the thing to pay attention in the first stages of the race? Aizawa just answers, the door. The robots come out as Todoroki is in the lead. Todoroki freezes the ground freezing every contestant he can and freezing the robots of balance he keeps running past the robots and making them fall on the other students. Midoriya who evaded the robot and sees it falling instinctively jumps up and using 5% of his power smashes the robot throwing him in the opposite direction. He lands and continues running being in second place now. He keeps up the 5% power and moves it to his legs to go faster catching up to Todoroki by the time they get to the second obstacle. Todoroki notices him catching up and tries to freeze Midoriya in place. Midoriya evades most of the ice but eventually gets stuck in the middle of the of the obstacle. Todoroki pulls ahead as Bakugu is catching up to them. Midoriya looks back and sees other students coming. He then decides to use a Detroit smash to break the ice he is trapped in and free himself and starts going towards Todoroki with Bakugu in front of him now. He reaches the third obstacle and sees Todoroki and Bakugu right in front of him he decides to just jump over the minefield and uses 100% power to jump over the minefield. He leaves a big crater in the ground and just zooms by Todoroki and Bakugu. He goes so fast that he reaches the finish line and his crashes against a wall in the stadium. He is then sent to the infirmary to heal until the next round starts. The rest of the people end the same way they do in the anime. The second event is announced a cavalry battle. Midoriya has 1 million points and is instantly avoided by everybody until Achako decides to pair up with him. Midoriya is approached by Meihatsu wanting to get the most spotlight she can. Midoriya then goes to Aida wanting to team up with him but Ida thinks on what Todoroki said and declines. Midoriya then comes up with a plan B and gets Takoyami on his team and they decide to run away the whole event in order to protect the 1 million points. The event goes pretty much like in the anime. Small exception, since Midoriya can use 1 for all without breaking his bone he manages to keep everybody away using 5% of 1 for all and at the end of the cavalry battle Midoriya's team manages to claim victory and they claim victory. Todoroski group ends up second, Bakugu's team ends third and Shinsu's team ends fourth. However Ajiro and Nairnjiki showed a forfeit because of the mind control and Tetsu Tetsu and Ibarra Shizaki get bumped up to the tournament. The fights are announced and Midoriya has to fight Shinsu now. Before the fight actually starts Ajiro warns him not to answer any of S. Hintz's questions, as that is how he brainwashes people. Midoriya reflexes a bit on this and gets ready to the fight. The fight starts and Shinsu starts insulting Midoriya which doesn't work. Midoriya gets ready to attack thinking he doesn't need one for all in this fight. Then Shinsu starts insulting Ajiro and Midoriya reacts getting brainwashed. Shinsu tells Midoriya to be a good little hero and to step out of bounds. Midoriya tries to resist but is unsuccessful. Shinsu starts talking about his life. As Midoriya starts getting closer and closer to getting out of bounds he starts having strange visions. He sees about eight people in the door and a strange feeling starts overwhelming him. He activates one for all in his fingers and flicks them creating massive wind presser, even stronger than in the anime. He then turns to Shinsu and runs at him. This time he decides Shinsu is a threat and without responding to a single word of Shinsu's taunting punches Shinsu out of bounds by hitting Shinsu with 5% of 1 for all. Midoriya wins and passes to the next round. The next few fights end the same as they do in the anime. Todoroki beats Siro by a landslides. Kaminari loses to Ibarra. They forfeits after toying with Ida and using him to advertise her inventions. Ashido beats Ayama. Takoyami beats Yeyurazu. And unfortunately Yuraka loses against Bakugu. After a draw Kirishima beats Tetsu Tetsu in an arm wrestle. The second round starts the first fight as Midoriya versus Todoroki. Before the fight starts Midoriya finds Endeavor in the hallway and talks to him. They have pretty much the same exchange the do in the anime. The fight actually starts. Todoroki starts by trying to freeze Midoriya in place. Midoriya counters by throwing a 5% Delaware smash at Todoroki breaking the ice. This cycle repeats a couple of times. Then Midoriya tells at Todoroki, You know you haven't laid a single scratch on me. Use your fire Todoroki. We are all giving our best to be able to win it is only fair that you do the same. Todoroki hearing this asks Midoriya. Did my father put you up to this? Is he bribing you or something? I have told him a thousand time I am not going to use his quirk. Midoriya then shouts at Todoroki. You don't understand. It's your power it's your power Todoroki. 
None his. Todoroki tells Midoriya. Okay just remember you asked for this. As he activating his fireside he smiles at Midoriya and starts attacking him with everything he has. This is the point when the fight really starts. As everybody in the stands is watching on the edge of their seats. They see Todoroki throwing combination of ice and fire at Midoriya as he evades every single attack and takes opportunity of the small intervals between Todoroki's attacks to attack himself. Attacks which Todoroki blocks with his ice. Midoriya tells Todoroki. You won't be able to beat me like that Todoroki with a smile on his face and they both get ready for a full-scale attack. Midoriya throws a Detroit smash at 100% power and Todoroki uses a flash freeze heatwave. Both attacks collide creating a huge explosion that knocks both Midoriya and Todoroki out of bounds and ends up knocking them both out resulting in a tie. The next few fights occur. Ida beats Ibarra. Hiroshima loses to Bakugu and Takoyami beats Ashido. The rematch with Midoriya and Todoroki also is, for simplicity, an arm wrestle, which Midoriya easily wins using one for all that enhances his strength. The semi-finals start. Ida vs Midoriya. They both respect each other and in this scenario see each other as rivals. The fight starts and Ida tries to end it quick by pushing him out of bounds. Sadly this plan fails as Midoriya reacts to fast and jumps over Ida and punches Ida in the back using a 3% smash. This coupled with the momentum Ida had accumulated throws Ida out of bounds, giving Midoriya the victory. The fight of Bakugu vs Takoyami ends the same. W.S. Bakugu claiming victory. The finals. Bakugu vs Midoriya. A faded battle between rivals. A rematch for the ages. Bakugu starts the fight throwing a giant explosion at Midoriya, which Midoriya manages to evade. Midoriya before the fight started tried to think of ways to beat Bakugu in a fight not coming up with any that don't involve him going at least at 100%. So that is what Midoriya does. Bakugu doesn't let Midoriya get close knowing that if Midoriya does he will lose so he tries to keep the battle ranged. At a certain point Bakugu shoots a huge explosion at Midoriya. Midoriya at the same time throws a Delaware smash at the same time negating the explosion. Deku then leaps from out of the smoke throwing a 100% Detroit smash. Bakugu evades the hit barely, but the wind pressure throws him away. Midoriya then leaps after Bakugu. While Midoriya is in the Bakugu throws the biggest explosion he can to take advantage of the moment and manages to abruptly throw Midoriya out of bounds winning the battle. Bakugu then realizes, wait that shouldn't be possible those hits didn't hurt as much as last time. He was holding back and runs at Midoriya screaming at him. Midnight at this point uses her quirk and makes him fall asleep. Later at the prize giving ceremony Bakugu is tied up like in the anime because he feels he got a false victory. Midoriya ended second place and Ida and Takoyami end third. Although Ida has to rush to the hospital so isn't there. All Might jumps in and gives the winners a small speech. He tells Takoyami that he did well. Tells Midoriya that congratulations and thanks for doing what I asked of you. Thank you young Midoriya. He also tells Bakugu that he did exactly what he said he what he said he was going to do. But Bakugu just lashes out saying that it wasn't a true victory. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Part 5 Season 1. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. Where we left off, Bakugu beat Midoriya in the finals of the sports festival. The medals are awarded and All Might gives everybody words of encouragement. He tells Takoyami that he did a good job. Ada although he placed fourth isn't there because he went to the hospital to see his brother. All Might tells Midoriya, good job young Midoriya you proved your worth as the fledgling symbol of peace. And tells Bakugu, you didn't win but you got pretty close to, overall I would say you did a good job. And Bakugu who is tied up rages at All Might. Two days pass and Midoriya is taking the train to school when a person in the train asks, Hey, hey you Midoriya from the UA Sports Festival, right? Everybody in the train starts congratulating him on ending second. Midoriya is walking to school from the train station and Ida zooms past him, saying, Morning Midoriya. Midoriya starts running behind him and when they get in the building Midoriya is going to ask Ida how he is feeling and Ida answers, If it's about my brother, don't worry everything is going to be fine. And everybody in the class is talking about being recognized on their way to school. Aizawa walks in the class instilling order. Aizawa explains that now they will be doing the internships. He says, After the sports festival where pro heroes got to see your performances they have the chance to invest in your potential by sending offers. You get three sport festivals to show them what you have, one chance every year and three chances in a lifetime. 
but you guys need to choose your hero names. Midnight comes into the class and Aizawa says, since I am a horrible judge I called Midnight to decide. She gets final say. This part occurs pretty much like in the anime. Midoriya chooses the hero named Deku. This time partly feeling obligated because everybody chanted it in the sports festival. And the rest of the class choose the same names. Aizawa gets up and says, now that that is out of the way. Aizawa pushes a button and a screen behind him displays the offers that everybody got. Aizawa says, it's been more spread out in previous years. Midoriya got 4,056 offers. Bakugou 3,556. Todoroki got 2,019. Takoyami got 360 and Ida got 301. Everybody looks at the board in surprise and Ashido asks, Wait how did Todoroki get so many offers if he didn't place that high in the final tournament? Todoroki says, It's because of my father. The students go through their choices until the end of the lesson. Midoriya is nerding out mumbling how he is going to choose by making a system, weirding everybody out. After snapping Midoriya back to reality Uraraka asks him, I've been meaning to ask you Deku, why are you trembling? Midoriya answers, oh this, this is exercise. And they start commenting on the exercise Midoriya is doing which pisses Bakugou off. Midoriya goes with his friends to the cafeteria to have lunch. A worried All Might stops them from going. Midoriya and All Might go to a corner to discuss this. All Might says, you did very good in the sports festival young Midoriya. And a lot of people are very impressed by you. How? However my old master also send you a offer, it came a bit late. His name is Gran Torino. If you want to go with him then I can't stop you. Midoriya thinks to himself, wow this person must really be something if he trained All Might, the symbol of peace. A little later Aizawa cheeks the agencies that people choose. He is surprised at three of them. Midoriya is going with a Gran Torino who is that. I am sure he got better offers than that. And Ida going to manuals. And Todoroki is going to intern with his father. Has the world gone mad? He says to himself. A couple of days pass and everybody says goodbye to each other at the train station. Uraraka and M. Idoriya check up on Ida telling him that if he ever needs to talk about what happened that they will always be there. While this is happening Todoroki looks at them from a distance and leaves. They all go their separate ways. Midoriya arrives at the address given to him. He thinks, is this the right place? He knocks on the door and proceeded to opens it. He sees an old man on the floor surrounded by ketchup. Midoriya screams, oh my god he's dead. Gran Torino gets up and says, I'm not dead. Midoriya then screams again, he isn't dead. Gran Torino then asks, who are you Sonny? Midoriya leaves his suit on the floor and gets on the phone, wanting to call All Might to ask if this man was sane. Gran Torino inspecting Midoriya's suit says, okay, let's get serious. It seems like you can take the full force of one for all without any backlash, but you need to know how to use smaller amounts of the power to not kill everybody around you. Aside from that, from what I have seen in the sports festival, your admiration for All Might seems to act like shackles. Midoriya asks, shackles? Gran Torino says, okay then, let's try something. You are to try to land an attack on me without using 100%, since it's too destructive. Midoriya responds in concern. Wait if I land a smash on you, even a weaker one I'm not sure if you can take it. Gran Torino starts jumping through the room and says, just do it. And Midoriya says, alright. Midoriya takes a bunch of 5% swings at Gran Torino missing every one of them. Gran Torino then starts attacking Midoriya. Midoriya blocks a couple of his attacks but Gran Torino is too fast eventually. Midoriya gets frustrated and moves his arm at a higher percentage than usual. The wind pressure created moves and breaks the microwave. Gran Torino then stops the exercise. Look what you did kid. Now I have to order another one. Gran Torino says. Go home we will resume the exercise tomorrow. Your movements are too stiff kid and your reaction time to slow. Reflect on that. Midoriya goes home and on his way he keeps reflecting on what Gran Torino said. My moves are too stiff. What makes a movement stiff? He thinks to himself. After a bit of time on the train he gets nowhere and says okay think of it from another point of view what makes a movement flexible. He ponders on everything Gran Torino told him, and realizes has been thinking of his quirk as a switch to turn on and off when needed. This makes him to slow so he needs to start leaving the switch on. The next day Midoriya arrives at Gran Torino's place. He takes the package from Almazan in and they have breakfast. Gran Torino asks Midoriya, have you though of what I told you yesterday? Midoriya answers, yes. Gran Torino says, great ready to spar. They finish their breakfast and stretch a bit. Gran Torino then jumps and starts ping-ponging through the room. Midoriya then activates one for all this time through his whole body and waits for Gran Torino to attack when Gran Torino does, it's from the back. Midoriya turns super fast and then strikes at Gran Torino. Gran Torino dodges but Midoriya managed to scratch him. Gran Torino stops and says, good job kid, wanna go again. Remember focus on keeping your power level low. You want to move fast, but not at the expense of everybody around you. But go again and again. 
Midoriya in every fight tries different things. At a certain point he imitates Gran Torino and starts ping-ponging around. He manages to catch Gran Torino off guard barely hitting him again. But Midoriya not realizing where he was going and not having time to react hits the wall face first. Gran Torino says, Ha, huh, if you want to imitate me kid you have to be more maneuverable in the air and have to be aware of your surroundings. Let's go again, Gran Torino says. And they do. Midoriya in this whole training has improved his technique a lot. Knight arrives and Gran Torino says, Okay kid let's go. Midoriya asks, Where are we going Gran Torino? Gran Torino says, To Tokyo, to fight some villains. This area doesn't have that many people meaning a small crime rate it's easier to fight opponents in the city. If you fight too much against me like you have been doing, you will start develop some weird habits. Midoriya and Gran Torino get on the train. Midoriya thinks, we will be passing through Hasu, maybe I should send Ida a text. As he does Midoriya thinks, that's weird Ida usually takes a maximum of 3 minutes to answer after he has seen a text. At this point the train that Midoriya and Gran Torino are on is passing over Hasu. People from the train start seeing fire in the city. An emergency announcement is given to the passengers and the train activates the brakes and it starts slowing down. It's at this point that a pro hero is thrown through the walls of the train by a big bluish monster. Midoriya looks at it a bit in shock and says, Namu. Gran Torino leaps into action telling Midoriya to stay there and throwing the Namu into the city. Once the train stops Midoriya jumps down to the streets to help people with the crisis that was happening. He hears Manuel calling for Ada and wants to help the heroes tell him to get out of here they have things handed. Midoriya knowing what Stain did to Ada's brother. That Stain was last seen in Hasu, that Stain attacks three to four pro heroes per city and that he usually works in back alleys starts going around trying to find Ida and Sam. He eventually stumbles across an alley and just as Stain is about to deliver the final blow on Ida Midoriya activates his new full cowling ability he had been working on with Gran Torino and jumps around getting closer to Stain and he punches Stain in the face. Stain stumbles a bit and then looks at Midoriya. Midoriya looks around seeing that that there is an injured pro hero on the floor. Midoriya tells Ida, Come on Ida get up so we can save that injured pro. Ida tells Midoriya, I can't. I can't move Midoriya. I think it has to do with the hero killer's quirk. Get out of here Midoriya you have nothing to with this. Midoriya says, I won't. After all like All Might said, meddling where you don't technically have to is the essence of being a hero. Satin smiles. Midoriya while he was speaking sent his location in a text. Midoriya then jumps at Stain. Stain counterattacks and Midoriya jumps over the attack and hits Stain from the top. Stain says, you have what it takes to be a great hero. As he is about to lick the knife with Midoriya's blood, Midoriya flicks his finger at 100% power. The alley gets obliterated. You can hear all the windows breaking as the blast continues and hits Stain. Stain hits the other side of the alley, inches from death. At this point Todoroki arrives and sees Stain and lying on the floor and says, Midoriya, you should give more context with your texts, but it seems you had it handled. Midoriya helps Ida and Nadava up after Stain's quirk stopped taking effect, and they take Stain towards the other pros and police, while the six Namu keep attacking the city. A well-dressed man along with Kirijiri walk down a bridge towards Tartarus prison. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Season 6 Part 1 of What If Deku Could Use 100% of One for All. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. In the previous episode Deku took out Stain in an alley in Hasu, while six Nomis were attacking Hasu City. At the same time in another location a well-dressed man stands in front of Tartarus Prison. At Tartarus Prison, All for One activates his strength enhancing quirks and punches the prison creating a huge hole in the wall. All for One and Kirijiri then walk in the prison. They make way towards the control room. Once they get there they kill the guards and deactivate all the security measures Tartarus has. All for One tells Kirijiri to make a portal towards the cells and to release the inmates and afterwards to meet him at the entrance of the prison. All for One then appears in the middle of the prison and all the cell doors open releasing all the inmates. All for One presents himself to everybody in the prison as their savior. Shigaraki then quickly walks to All for One's side. Surprised Shigaraki says, Sensei, you came. At this point at UA, All Might gets a phone call from Sukoichi. All Might picks up to phone and says, Hello old friends, how are things? Sukoichi then yells at All Might over the phone. There is no time for pleasantries All Might, there is an attack at Tartarus, we need you. 
All Might quickly inflates and within five minutes he finds himself at the bridge leading to Tartarus Prison. All Might coordinates with the police that find themselves at the bridge. They form a defensive perimeter as to not let any villain reach the city. While All Might coordinates with the police the villains move from the entrance of the prison towards the blockade. The villains reach the middle of the bridge and see All Might and a couple other heroes along with the police. The other heroes aren't all that important, since the other important heroes are busy in Hasu. They spot the heroes and the police and the villains start to freak out. All for One turns to Shigaraki and touches him on the shoulder, passing the quirk of All for One to Shigaraki. All for One then says, That power is the biggest one in this world. Don't you dare waste it. Master that power to Mura and you will make me proud. I have prepared a path for you, to Mura Shigaraki. All for One then turns toward Kirajiri, make sure he reaches his full potential. All for One turns towards the crowd of villains behind him. He says, This is Tamura Shigaraki. He is my successor and as the master of the shadows and the one who has just freed you all from imprisonment you will follow him in exchange for your freedoms. All the villains accept the deal. All for One turns again to Kirajiri and says, Take them away, to a safe place. The hideout isn't safe. I will keep All Might busy. Kirajiri then opens a huge portal through which all the villains escape. All for One just walks towards the barricade. Once he is close enough he just shoots his air cannon using his strength enhancing quirks making a combo. All Might is the only one not to be blown away by All for One's power. After the attack is finished All Might prepares himself and attacks All for One with a Detroit smash. But the attack is met by a giant hand, which All for One threw. All Might says, How are you alive, All for One? All for One says, After our previous encounter, I was severely damaged, but thanks to some help and a region quirk I acquired I managed to survive, and I seem in better condition than you All Might. All Might tries to launch another attack but again it is met by another counter-attack. In the era news chopper starts broadcasting the events that are unfolding. Back in Hasu the heroes have arrived at the alley where Midoriya, Hida and Todoroki are. They find the hero killer very badly beaten but start moving him towards the police station. While moving Stain to the police station Midoriya sees a TV screen on which he sees the fight occurring. Ida turns to him and asks, aren't you coming Midoriya? Midoriya doesn't answer simply looking at the screen with a worried look on his face. Back at the bridge All Might is starting to get worn down. It is at this point that All for One says, Izuku Midoriya, a quirkless child who upon finishing middle school suddenly manifested a quirk. Your successor. All Might still wears a smile on his face, but on the inside he finds himself being very worried. All for One continues speaking, Tamura Shigaraki, my successor, the grandson of Nana. He pauses for a second, Nana Shimura. All Might's expression changes as he hears that, to a very worried one. All for One laughs as he sees this, finally something that takes that stupid smile off your face. I was thinking what is the one thing that would hurt you the most? And when I found the child I realized I could teach him to hate you, to hate this society you have created. He is my power and will become the next me. All Might gets enraged at this and attacks All for One. All for One easily evades and hits All Might. He says, your power has weakened All Might. I know this and you do too. I even got confirmation of this at the USJ. Our last fight left you more damaged than anyone thought and you have also passed down one for all. You have no power left All Might. There is no way you can keep them safe anymore. Sokoichi get up from the wreckage and screams, you can do it All Might. Other people and heroes get up and will cheering All Might on. Across the country, even the planet people watch the fight on the news cheering All Might on. Even Midoriya, Ida and Todoroki watching from Hasu are screaming cheering All Might on. All Might gets inspired by this and summons all his strength and all the power of one for all left in his system throwing a punch. All for one counter attacks but the moment that their fists make contact All Might switches the power from one arm to the other, sacrificing his arm. All Might screams, United Stats of Smash, hitting All for one right in the face throwing him to the bottom of the ocean. The massive wind pressure created by the smash destabilizes the helicopter forcing them to have to land in the city. In his mind All Might says, goodbye one for all. The smash that All Might just threw is so powerful that the bridge starts to crumble and starts to fall apart. All for One is now at the bottom of the ocean with pieces of rubble from the bridge falling on him. As the bridge is crumbling All Might jumps of the side of it landing safely in the water. He then starts moving towards the score. When All Might arrives on shore the reporter says, All Might any comments? All Might turns to the camera saying, Next it's your turn. Back in Hasu the Nomis who were not defeated just disappeared into portals. The day is safe. Many people have gathered around the TV from a store. As All Might's message is broadcast to the world, everybody starts cheering. Ada and Todoroki just look at Midoriya who is crying. They ask him if he is alright. Midoriya thinks to himself, I have to be strong, like All Might. Midoriya wipes the tears from his eyes and turns to his friends saying, 
Yes, I'm fine. Let's go back to the people responsible for us. The next day All Might is on the news, announcing his official retirement and endeavor for his continued valor, especially during the Hasu attack, gets promoted to the number one hero. Todoroki, Ida and Midoriya find themselves in the hospital. They all have very minor injuries but were taken there as a precaution. While they are there the chief of police of Hasu comes in the room. He scolds the young heroes but afterwards he congratulates them for a job well done telling them, you have disregarded every single rule and should be arrested. But due to All Might's retirement and to the fact that you have defeated a very dangerous criminal that not even the pros could defeat we will be covering up the story. No one will know it was you who defeated Stain. That means you will get none of the credit but also none of the repercussions. Even so I don't think that many people might be interested, since All Might's retirement is the most important thing on the news. That said, I would like to thank you all for a job well done. Ada and Todoroki say, well actually it was Midoriya who did all of the work. Ida continues, I was looking for revenge for my brother. And Todoroki finishes, and I arrived after the fight was over. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Season 1 Part 7 of What If Deku Could Use 100% of One For All. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. A few minutes after All Might announces his retirement Endeavor asks him, what exactly does it mean to be the symbol of peace All Might? All Might looks at Endeavor wondering exactly what he means. Endeavor notices this and continues. I had the most wins under my belt as a hero compared to you. I took on way more villains than you and even so you were number one. You were number one and you were the one who inspired confidence for people you deterred crime even if I was the one who defeated more villains. What does it mean to be the symbol All Might? All Might answers. Being the symbol of peace will be different for you Endeavor as it was for me. There were plenty of strong heroes before I arrived. I came onto the scene and saw society, I saw it needed a pillar. A pillar to support everyone, or you could also call it a light. Before me people looked up to the heroes but the heroes had nobody to look up to. I thought that was something that society needed, somebody who would inspire even the strongest. The reason I never stopped smiling is so I could inspire everybody. But to answer you question, the symbol is somebody who has to inspire confidence to even the strongest of heroes and has to be the one who will defeat every villain in his way whatever it takes. The most important thing in my opinion is to smile, to show you won't lose, but you as the next symbol should do it your way. Endeavor looks at All Might thinking. All Might says, I'm sorry I probably rumbled a bit, I hope I made myself clear. Endeavor turns to leave and says, you made yourself very clear All Might, you have just given me a lot to think about. A few days later the students return to class after the internships are over. When Midori arrives at the school, he walks into class and sees everybody talking about their internships and about the fight between All Might and All for One they all saw on their news. All Might comes in the class. The class not used to seeing him in his deflated form takes a couple of moments to realize who he is. While All Might says, get ready everybody, we are doing hero fundamental training, we are doing a rescue training lesson in Ground Gamma. Ida asks, why would we be going there for rescue training sir, wouldn't it be smarter to go to the unforeseen simulation joint? All Might says, normally yes, but this time we are doing something a bit different. The students get their suits and convene at Ground Gamma. They're All Might, who is wearing a sweatshirt that looks like his uniform but more fitting to his deflated form, explains the exercise a bit better. You will all be split into groups of five. You will have to maneuver through the environment to reach the person in need, in this case that is me. The person who saves me is the one who will win the exercise. And Tsuyu says, so, it's basically a race. And All Might says a bit embarrassed, yeah. All Might tells the students of the first round Midoriya, Ida, Ajiro, Siro and Ashido to get in position while he goes to hide in the area. A few minutes later All Might pushes a button and some speakers sound a noise that tells all the students to start. Midoriya goes into a full cowl at a 10% maneuvering through environment very well. Everybody looks at Midoriya surprised at how he is restraining himself as to not break the environment. Bakugou realizes that Midoriya's moves are imitating him a bit and looks at Midoriya in disgust. The exercise ends in 87 seconds. Midoriya won with Siro having almost reached All Might. Siro says disappointed. Oh a man, I lost, but this environment was made for me. At the same time that this was going on a video makes its way around the internet. A creepy video inspiring followers of Stain to join Shigaraki's organization to join the League of Villains. In a bar Shigaraki is recruiting new recruits that were brought to him by Jiren. After the rescue training race is finished, All Might asks to speak to Midoriya in private. 
Midoriya agrees and goes with him. All Might asks Midoriya, Remember what I told you when I gave you my power. Midoriya says, Eat this, while making an All Might face. All Might says, No, not that. But nonetheless I told you about this being the power that has been passed from generation to generation. I think it is time you know the whole story. One for all came from a separate quirk, one called all for one. A symbol of ultimate evil, just as one for all is supposed to be the one of ultimate good. I don't know the whole story, but from what I know there are originally two brothers. One of them had the power to give and take quirks, the other was known to be quirkless. Older brother gave his younger brother a stockpiling quirk so he would have a way to control him. But unbeknownst to him his younger brother had the power to pass on his quirk. Useless on its own but together the quirks combined together and made what we now know as one for all. Midori asks, what happened to the big brother, to all for one? All Might answers, I defeated him once and for all a couple of days ago. He drowned in the river. But the thing is something far more sinister is happening now. His successor Tamura Shigaraki is my predecessor's grandson. I believe he now has the quirk known as all for one. And if I'm right you are the one who will have to defeat him in the league he has been building. Midoriya nods and tells All Might, As your successor I will defeat this great evil, so you can rest easy All Might. Thanks young Midoriya says All Might. A couple of weeks pass and the students now find themselves freaking out about the final exams. Everybody in the class is worried about the final exams. Ashido and Kaminari are the worst ones here, since they haven't studied. Midoriya isn't very worried as he did pretty well in the midterm he just wonders what they will be doing for the practical portion of the exam. Midoriya, Yuraka, Asui, Todoroki and Ida go to the cafeteria for lunch. While they are having lunch they discuss what they could be doing for the practical exam. Monoma approaches them and taunts them saying, I heard you faced the hero killer, wow you guys just attract the bad guys don't you? Did you shit your pants when you faced him? Monoma asks. And Midoriya mutters, I think he did when he faced us. Monoma asks, what was that are you agreeing with me? Kendo comes up behind him and kits Monoma in the head knocking him out. She says, I'm sorry about that. He tends to go off the rails and needs to be put in check I got distracted. I heard what you were saying. If it's about the practical exams, we will be facing robots like those of the entrance exam. A friend of mine who is an upperclassman told me. The students relax thinking if it's robots it's going to be easy. The next few days the students study and practice and study. Siro, Kaminari, Ashido, Anjiro and Gyro study with Yeyarazu. Kirishima studies with Bakugu and Midoriya alone at home. In a bar not to away Shigaraki talks to his new army of villains his strongest league. He has all the villains from Tartarus and those who were attracted by Stain. Kirajiri comes to speak to Shigaraki. Kirajiri says, There is a man of a prestigious organization called the Eight Precepts of Death who wants to speak with you Tamura Shigaraki. Shall I arrange a meeting? Shigaraki says, Yes, since Master's death we need to organize ourselves better. The symbol of peace is gone. It's time for darkness to reign so we need to expand our organization. By the way how is the other plan going? And the procuration of new headquarters, this place is getting quite crowded. Kirajiri says, I made contact with the old ally I told you about, and as for the new headquarters it should be ready in the next few days. Before the first phase of the plan starts, Shigaraki says, good keep me informed. Back at the school the students write the exam. Once they finish writing him many people are happy with how they, those who studied with her thank Yeyarazu for helping them study. The students then grab their uniforms and put them on making their way to the building where they will do the practical exams. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to part 1 season 2 of What If Deku Could Use 100%. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. The students meet the teachers in front of the testing facility. Nezu steps out of the crowd of teachers and says, You all probably have some idea on what you will be doing for the final exams, which is why we are totally changing things up. This statement surprises the students in a huge, why not? can be heard. The principal then continues by explaining the exams. You will be fighting us teachers in teams of two. You win if you either capture the teacher using these handcuffs or escape to call for help. Mina then says, wait but that is way unfair. You guys have a lot more experience and training. Nezu then answers the students' concerns. Don't worry about that. We will be wearing handicaps. In the form of these ways made by Meihatsum, they add a third of our body weight. This calms the students a bit. 
Aizawa then says, Now to announce the battles, we have decided upon these based on relationships, weaknesses, strengths and multiple other factors. The first fight will be Bakugu and Midoriya against me. The second will be Hagakure and Shoji against Snipe. The third Minda and Siro against Midnight. The fourth Koda and Gyro against Present Mike. The fifth Ajiro and Ida against Power Loader. The sixth Kirishima and Sato against Cementos. The seventh Ashido and Kaminari against the Principal. The eight Yuraka and Ayama against Thirteen. The ninth Asui and Takoyami against Ectoplasm. And the tenth fight will be Yeyurazu and Todoroki against. While Aizawa is saying this a figure comes out of the building and Aizawa finishes saying, Endeavor. Todoroki looks at his father angry but his classmates calm him down a pit. Aizawa says to Bakugu and Midoriya, You two have ten minutes to get ready. Before we go to the urban area for your exam, use it for whatever you want although I would recommend you use it to strategize. He then leaves to go prepare himself. Midoriya turns to Bakugu and says, Come on catch and we need to come up with a strategy to fight him. Bakugu turns to leave and as he does he says, You know what Deku, I won't need your help. As far as I am concerned you can just run and hide, that's all you're good for anyway. Midoriya looks at Bakugu thinking, Aizawa can be a huge pain. Under normal circumstances we could each beat him individually. But with Aizawa's quirk we are at a huge disadvantage. Plus we will probably get in each other's way. Midoriya then goes to stop Bakugu and says, Come on we aren't going to be able to do anything if we act like that. Bakugu hits Midoriya's hand away and keeps walking. Fifteen minutes later at the housing district exam area the students get ready to go. Midoriya knowing that Bakugu and him are always at odds thinks let's get this over with. Midoriya powers up to about 20% power. And in full cow stars running around the urban area reaching the exit in 17, two seconds before anything not even a first blow could be thrown. The rest of the other fights go the same. All of them except for the last one. Todoroki and Yeyarazu vs Endeavor. The two students find themselves in a city area. Todoroki explains Yeyarazu what the plan is. I will be the main attack. I will hit him with bridges of both ice and fire while you support with cannons and other stuff from the back. As Todoroki goes to enact the plan Yeyarazu grabs him by the arm, she shyly says, Todoroki, maybe. I think you are too emotional in this case. Maybe I should be the one to come up with a plan. Todoroki breaths for a moment and says, Sorry, Yeyarazu, go ahead tell me your plan. Yeyarazu proceeds to explain her plan to Todoroki, against your father, you will be too emotional, you should try to keep a cool head, but above all we should avoid the fight and go to the exit. Endeavor is the number one hero, former number two, we don't have much chance of beating him, but if we do engage maybe this will be a good weapon. Momo proceeds to make a binding cloth made out of shape memory alloy. Todoroki asks, why are you making Aizawa's binding cloth? Yeyarazu says, I don't know the exact composition, this one is a little different, it's made out of a special alloy that will become solid when heated up, that and these will give us the edge. Yeyarazu makes two fire extinguishers. From the main street Endeavor is heard shouting, Shuatu, come out and face me. Todoroki keeps his cool and says, okay, he's in the middle of the street, let's go around, as you said, we should avoid fighting. The students run through the alleys coming out onto the main street. Endeavor notices them and throws a huge fire blast at them which is blocked by a thick ice wall that slowly melts by the end of the attack. Todoroki then throws a huge iceberg attack at Endeavor. He then runs away and tells Yeyurazu to follow him saying, Come on Yeyurazu, we have to get going. Not long after, Endeavor melts through the ice and goes after the two students. He approaches the two and goes after Todoroki. When he is about to blast him, Yeyarazu uses a fire extinguisher at Endeavor's face. Endeavor stumbles back, moving the foam out of his face as he can't see. During this, Yeyarazu uses the binding cloth around Endeavor. Todoroki then uses his flames to attack Endeavor, making the cloth solidify, trapping Endeavor. They then put the cuffs on Endeavor winning the exam. When they are returning to the facility, Endeavor tells Todoroki, Good job Shoto, you did well, avoiding the fight was the right choice. Todoroki dismisses Endeavor's statement by giving him the cold shoulder. The exercise wins with the same people passing and failing as in the main continuity. After the exams are over, the students reconvene in the classroom, where Aizawa tells them that everybody who failed the exam will also be going to the forest training camp. It was just a logical deception to get the students to give their best. Ida says, if you keep doing that, don't you think we will lose trust in what you say? Aizawa says, think whatever you want. The students make a plan to go to the mall. In this version of events things go normally without Shigaraki going there as he is busy, coordinating an attack. After the mall Midoriya gets a message from Bakugu. The message says, meet me at the clearing in the forest in an hour you damn nerd. An hour later, Midoriya has gone home to leave the stuff he bought at the mall and then went to the clearing in the forest. Bakugu is waiting there and says, you are late Deku. Midoriya says, sorry I kind of had something to do first. Midoriya and Bakugu have a small discussion about how Midoriya got so powerful. 
Bakugu screams at him. I didn't have to even throw a punch in our exam. You just rushed through the gate in seconds. How are you so damned fast? I was supposed to be number one Deku. Not you. So how did a quirkless wannabe become so powerful? Midoriya says. Throw training Kakin. I train hard and my quirk superpower manifested while I did. Bakugu says. Bullshit Deku. I heard a rumor the villain that All Might defeated could transfer quirks. It's obvious that you and All Might are connected in some way. He has been behind you this whole time, supporting you, so tell me how you got All Might's quirk. Midoriya is surprised that Bakugu figured it all and stands there processing the information. Bakugu says, you aren't trying to deny it so it must be true. Midoriya says, so what if it is? All Might choose me Bakugu, he chose me as his successor. I am the one who will become the world's next symbol of peace. Bakugu says, get ready then. Midoriya asks, what, what do you mean? Bakugu says, I want you to show me the power of the number one hero. Midoriya says, wait Bakugu, it could kill you if I use all of my power. Bakugu says, I don't care how much power you use I just want you to show me, as he attacks Midoriya with an explosion. Midoriya easily doges the attack and hits Bakugu in the stomach with a 17% smash, making him vomit and stumble back. Bakugu falls to his knees from the pain. He then gets up and throws a huge explosion at Midoriya. Midoriya uses one of his fingers, throwing enough wind pressure to stop the explosion and make it backwards. Midoriya then runs at Bakugu. Adrenaline pumping throughout his body Midoriya powers his fist up to 31% and punches at Bakugu stopping right before he hits Bakugu's face. Midoriya then says, looks like I win Kachang. Bakugu falls back and looks behind him seeing that all those trees that were behind him are now broken. Midoriya in good sportsmanship helps Bakugu up and asks him, are you alright Bakugu? Bakugu says, I'll be fine Deku. Just know that I will surpass you. I will be number one. You hear me I will be number one. Midoriya looks at Bakugu with a look of determination and tells him, No you won't but I'm looking forward to the challenge. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Season 2 Part 2. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. When we last left off, Izuku and Bakugu fought in a test of dominance. Although Bakugu tried his best, Izuku still ended out on top. A couple days passed and it was officially time for class wanted to go on their scheduled school trip to the lodge. Everyone was incredibly excited for this opportunity, but what no one was expecting was for Aizawa to stop the bus in what seemed to be the middle of nowhere. Alright everyone, time to get out. Aizawa called. Class wanna look to their teacher in confusion, but ultimately went along with their teacher's commands. This was when three new people arrived at the scene. A blonde-haired woman wearing a blue cat-themed outfit. Another woman. But she wore a red version of the outfit the previous one had on, and she had brown hair. Finally, a young-looking boy with a sour look on his face. Greetings UA students. We are the wild, wild, pussycats. The two spoke in unison. The brown-haired female began to explain Class 1A's current situation, which shocked the class. They weren't going to some sort of resort, but in fact, they were going to be staying at the base of a mountain that the pussycats own. You all have three hours to make it to the top of the mountain or else you won't get supper. The blonde added. Many of class 1A immediately tried to get back on the bus only for Aizawa to have left already. All right, I guess this won't be so bad. After all we just need to climb that mountain, right? Kaminari thought. Wrong, Pixie Bob exclaimed before slamming her hand on the ground. The ground began to morph itself into multiple different beasts made out of dirt which terrified the weaker members of Class 1A. Koda tried to use his quirk to control the beasts, but it had no effect on them seeing as how they weren't real animals, but just a manifestation of someone's quirk. Well, I guess we'll just have to fight our way through. Bakugu laughed, cracking his knuckles. Bakugu, Izuku, Ada, and Todoroki all leaped into action not too soon afterwards. Izuku's biggest challenge throughout all of it was trying to control his output of one for all. He could have just zoomed by the rest of the class and make it to the top of the mountain within the time given, but that would defeat the purpose of the exercise. That and it was good training for himself too. Some of the beasts he used too much strength attacking and caused enough wind pressure to cause some trees to collapse. Others he used too little and they were completely unharmed by his attacks which frustrated him. It took a little bit before he could find the right percentage to use against them that could still cut down the amount significantly. Thanks to the combined efforts of Class 1A, they were all able to make it to the mountain in a couple hours later than the deadline. But it was revealed that there are no expectations for Class 1A to even make it to the top of the mountain in that given time. 
This revelation irked some of the members quite a bit. Anyways, you all are going to be strengthening your quirks while you're at this training camp, Aizawa explained. This left Class 1A in confusion. What did their teacher mean by strengthening their quirks? Wasn't that what they were doing this whole time? I can see you all are confused by what I mean by this, so I'll give you all a demonstration. Bakugu, catch. Bakugu managed to catch a soft ball from Aizawa and was instructed to launch the ball as far as possible while staying within the restraints of the circle. Just like the beginning of the year which then made some of the members realize something. Minda was expelled, but he was still somehow part of their class. Before the class could ponder on this thought for any longer, they saw Bakugu launch the ball with furious intensity screaming die. This caused some of the class to sweat drop in response. Some things never seemed to change when it came onto Bakugu's character. 709.6 meters, Aizawa spoke blandly. What? No way. Bakugu should have gotten a crazily higher score than that, Kirishima shouted. Aizawa groaned hearing this. While it may be true you all have gone through your fair share of experiences during your time at UA honing your skills with your quirks, that's just it. You haven't actually been strengthening your quirks at all. Hence why Bakugu got the score he did. He hasn't been strengthening his quirk that much at all. Just finding different ways to use his quirk. This started to make sense in all of the students' eyes and their days of quirk strength building began. In Izuku's case, Aizawa pulled him away from the rest of the class for a moment. Now Izuku, I know you're incredibly strong already with your quirk, but I've been wondering if it was possible for you to go even further beyond your max output. Your quirk is similar to All Might's after all and even he seemed to be able to go beyond his limits during his last fight, Aizawa pondered. Oh, um, well you see, I never really tried doing that before to be honest. It never actually came to mind. All I really thought about for the longest was to get a better control with my quirk's output as you've seen with how destructive it can be. Aizawa nodded. Well, starting tomorrow, that's what we'll be doing. You'll be pushed to boost your quirk to beyond its current limits. If your current limit is 100%, let's see if we can get you to do 150% and even higher. Is that really necessary though, Aizawa-sensei? Izuku asked, midsection. Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive goes over the hard facts of the anime presented. Now in case, you guys didn't know, we have a third channel called Anime Theory. Anime theory mainly focuses on a large variety of mind-boggling anime theories. If you are interested in content like this, please go check the description below or click the icon in the top right corner. Now with that out of the way, let's get back into the story. Aizawa looked at Izuku with an intensity in his eyes that Izuku was not familiar with at all. It made him squeamish under his glare. It is absolutely necessary Midoriya. You'll never know when you're fighting a villain and 100% is not enough. When you have to go beyond. Plus Ultra. Izuku was speechless for a moment before nodding his head in the affirmative with a determined smile on his face. The next day in the crack of dawn, Class 1A is forced to wake up and sent out of their training camp cabin in order to start training in order to upgrade their quirks. When Class 1B is brought to the lodge as well and caught up to speed about what was going to be happening while they were there, they noticed how this training didn't seem to be in all that favorable of a condition. As a matter of fact, it looked like torture with the other students pushing their quirks to their absolute limit and then some. A couple of the members of Class 1B doubt that such a large group of students can be monitored by so few supervisors. This is when a large, muscular man wearing a brown version of the Pussycat's outfit appears. A woman with green hair wearing a yellow version of the uniform walked right beside him introducing themselves as Tiger and Ragdoll, the two other members of the Pussycats. Since you all doubt our skills, how about one of you come up and try to fight me? Anyone with a simple power-enhancing quirk will do, Tiger suggested. Izuku reluctantly goes up and charges at Tiger with around 65% of one for all. He felt that Tiger could probably take much more punishment considering he was a pro hero and from his appearance as well. It really seemed like he was on the physically stronger side as well hence why he decided to go at a higher percentage rate. This caught Tiger off guard and only his instinctive reflexes were able to save him here as he was able to just barely dodge Izuku's punch. A strong wave of air pressure was released from Izuku's punch though impressing the hero. Tiger tries to punch Izuku, but Izuku is able to leap away fast enough. Midoriya here is an exception. It's not necessarily power he lacks, but more so control. He'll be working on those two things though throughout this training. The Pussycats are actually a very suitable team of instructors for you all considering their large area of effect quirks, Aizawa pointed out. You're a strong one kid, but your movements are too straightforward and stiff. Something a villain may take advantage of if you aren't careful so that's another thing you should work on throughout this training. Tiger mentioned. Izuku took note of this and began to vigorously stretch. In the middle of the night, everyone was trying to learn how to cook curry. Izuku wasn't doing too good of a job, but he still tried. 
While cooking though, he noticed the little boy who was with the other pussycats at the time leave and disappear into somewhere else leaving Izuku in curiosity about the boy. Um, Mandalay, what's up with the little kid in your group? Is he one of your guys' kid? Izuku inquired. Mandalay simply shook her head before sighing. Well, you see, he's my nephew. His parents were both pro heroes. You may have known them as the water hose heroes. They were a hero duo, but dot 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 they died in the line of duty. When Koda was three, his parents were defending a city from a powerful villain. They managed to subdue the villain and save all of the civilians. But in exchange, their lives were lost that day. Their heroic efforts were constantly praised, but this ended up affecting Koda's view on heroes, warping his views to the point where he claims to hate heroes. Izuku felt pretty bad for the kid hearing this and wondered what the little one was currently doing considering how he hated heroes that much yet here he was stuck sharing a place with pro heroes and 40 students all learning how to become pro heroes. He decides to go on and look for the young one known as Koda in order to, hopefully, comfort him, let him know that he doesn't have to feel alone in this world. Despite what may have happened in the past, he doesn't have to isolate himself and burden himself with all those pent-up emotions he may probably be holding. He looks around the mountain for a bit before finally stumbling upon Koda. He had a bowl of curry with him made by one of the other students since his curry cooking was atrocious. Hi there. Izuku tries to greet the boy before offering the bowl of curry to him. I noticed that you didn't eat anything so I figured you may be hungry. Koda didn't respond to Izuku, but Izuku still rested the bowl on the floor in case Koda wanted any. Izuku sits down on the floor opposite to Koda going on to explain his awareness of the boy's unique circumstances. Naturally, Koda was enraged hearing this. I have a story. A story about a kid who was born quirkless. You see this kid was always mocked for not having a quirk, for being different from everyone else. He was seen as below everyone else. What's the point of this story? Koda interrupted. Izuku laughed a little hearing the boy's impatience. Well, the moral of this story is, well, to accept reality. Look Koda, you can't reject reality as it'll only hurt you even more. Koda's eyes twitch hearing this. Leave, Koda yelled. Izuku complies with the boy's command, raising his hands in defense as well. Sorry, Izuku whispered before leaving. During the two boys' interaction though, something was happening from behind the scenes. A few kilometers away from the camp, several masked figures appear from the shadows. Let's attack this camp now. We've been waiting for long enough already. A gruff voice states, Patience, it's simply not time yet. Another responded, This is simply a warning signal after all. The era of heroes will soon pass. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Welcome to Season 2 Part 3 What if Deku could use 100% of one for all? I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. The next series of events to befall the students down at the base of the mountainside came falling down. One after another, like a line of tragic dominoes nudged by a cruel boot, a miasma of smoke began to fill the forest, incapacitating and entrapping several within its toxic grasp. All the while a fire burned, the flames and intoxicating cyan blew against the endless black void that was the starless night sky, and a lone figure entrapped in a straitjacket wandered ominously down an unlit path in the beast's forest. Take them down. The false brilliance of the title of hero. We, the vanguard action squad of the League of Villains, will condemn them. Several kilometers off from the rest, a figure dressed in a dark blue coat, skin shriveled and dry like leather, stood with his hand pressed palm down against the surface of a tree. Blue flames emanate from his palm, starting a fire that seemed to spread from that tree to all of those around it, entrapping the encampment of students in a ring of scorching flame. Let's begin. Juzo would have grinned if he could. The odd, skull-like boy's tone merely holding an amused inflection as if to emulate a smile. Did Bakugo and Todoroki get so scared they fired off their quirks? Juzo, Kendo would scream, panic lacing her voice. Juzo's knees would collapse under the weight of his own body and he would fall, limp as a corpse, to the ground with his limbs sprawled out around him. In an effort to save her classmate, Yui, from a similar fate engulfed the girl in her enlarged fist, covering her own mouth with her opposing hand in an attempt to prevent herself from breathing in the poisonous cloud around them. Yui don't breathe it in. It's poisonous, she'd cry. Meanwhile, a glowering aura would encompass Pixie Bob and, just as suddenly, she would be ripped backwards off her feet by some foreign force before finding her skull pinned in between a large, battering ram-like magnet held in the hand by a shockingly large, and equally wide woman with shoulder length, reddish magenta hair, large lips, and a light dusting of facial hair. 
At her side kneeled a green, scaly-skinned lizard man armed with a variety of blades and clothed to mimic the hero killer himself. Hey there kiddies, were you looking for us? Magni would flamboyantly announce. Now be good kids and don't take another step or I'll crush the head of this sweet little pussy cat. Tiger almost immediately launched into action, knocking the monstrous woman's weapon aside and clashing with an explosion of force. The large, cat-like man battered the woman with a flurry of blows, all which were taken with great strike, blocked, absorbed. Turning Tiger would let a vicious roundhouse kick fly which Magni would narrowly avoid before striking back with a counterattack of her own that made Tiger slide back several feet. Damn it, predicting my cat combat moves, Tiger thought, dashing back in with claws bared and ready. Meanwhile, can you hear my telepath? Hurry up and come back to camp. I'm sorry, I don't usually know where you run off to. I'm sorry Koda, I can't come save you. Come back as soon as you can. The young boy could only stare on in abject horror as the large man, draped in black and masked, steadily encroached on him, his voice deep, resonating, and full of promises of very, very bad things. I tried searching somewhere with a nice view, and I ended up finding a face that was not on our list. Hey, by the way, you've got a nice hat there kid, Muscular would say, pointing a thick, meaty thumb at the mask he wore. Trade you for this lame mask, he would ask, grinning behind the porcelain. They made me wear this toy since I'm new, saying they couldn't get the shipment in time or something. Reaching up with his right hand, he plucked the mask off before casually tossing it to the side. Terrified at the large man, Koda turned to flee, tears of fear streaking down his freckled face. Kneeling down the tall man shot off the ground like a bullet, shattering the rock where he had been standing before slamming into the wall with similar effect and dropping down to the ground in front of the small boy. Let me get a shot in to cheer up. Extending a thick arm, tightly wound with sinewy and thick, hearty muscle, strands of pinkish-red muscle wrapped around his arm protruding from his skin and making his arm appear several times larger than previously. His killer grin visible from the shadows cast by the hood that he wore. Coda starred, paralyzed, at the man that had prematurely taken his parents from his years prior. Tears streaked down his face at the thought. Ew. Coda whispered. Muscular reared back his fist, aiming to smash Coda into dust before a streak of lighting slammed into the muscle-bound villain with all the force of a train catching him by surprise and sending him shooting across the cliffside and into the opposing wall with an explosion of air and rock. Midoriya, Koda would say, astonished at the arrival of the boy he had berated little more than an hour ago. The young, messy-haired boy gave him a smile. They don't know I'm here. Villains have attacked the camp and I'm here to save you and bring you back to the others. He said. He looked up when the villain who he had hit with a 100% smash not moments ago tore himself free of the rock. His body now a pulsating mass of pink muscle that made the man he was moments ago look short in comparison. That was a good hit kid. He really sent me flying, ha ha. He giggled manically. Now I suddenly have the urge to attack you, he said. In the blink of an eye muscular head dashed from where he stood in front of the two young boys, bringing both of his fists down atop them with a rumbling crackle of rock. Muscular glanced at the spot in confusion. Only green lightning remained where Midwaria had been moments ago. The aforementioned young hero was now holding Koda to the right of where they had just been. Setting the boy down he grit his teeth in frustration. Powering himself up with a surge of lightning his top was reduced to shreds as he dashed forward to meet the power villain. Slamming his fist into the man's thick, muscled hit his eyes widened at the little reaction the man had as he simply grew larger and larger. Bearing down on the green-haired boy with all the might of a god, he grunted as the villain swung a hook into his ribs and sent him flying into the mountainside. Grinning at his action muscular hardly had time to react as Midoriya was already down and back at it in the blink of an eye, throwing a jab straight combo that the man sidestepped before the straight caught him directly in the face with ample force to throw him back into the wall. Not letting up, Midoriya would dash forward with a shooting drop kick that would take muscular fully in the chest, powering him directly through the mountain and out to the other side. Midair, he balled up his right fist before shouting, One of all. 1000%, Delaware Detroit smash, to muscular a thousand fists would descend from the skies upon him, taking chunks of the man's fleshy armor before the final blow would strike him in the chest before sending him shooting down into the ground with enough force to flatten all the trees behind him and leave the man embedded several dozen feet into the ground beneath. Glancing down, Midoriya flailed his arms as he began falling straight down. He was going to die. This is the end, and it was going to be from gravity. Clenching his eyes shut he opened them slightly when he felt a familiar cloth wrap his body before pulling him to safety on the cliffside. It was Shota Aizawa, and he had Koda safely at his side. It happened again, didn't it? The eraser hero asked, cocking an eyebrow. Midoriya looked down at the remaining rags of the shirt he had been wearing, and at the large bruise that was beginning to form where Muscular had punched him. He could feel the broken bones shifting when he moved. I he began. A racer head shook his head. It's fine tell Mandalay to relay the information to the others that the students have permission to fight, understood. Aizawa asked, 
Midoriya nodded vigorously, and then leapt into action. Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive is a channel based on a variety of anime lore. If you are interested in content like this, make sure you click the icon on the top right corner or check the description below for a link to the channel. Now, with that out of the way let's get back into the story. You, Spinner would yell, are, not, a, real, hero. In a streak of lightning, Midoriya would appear from the brush and with a single punch cause Spinner's abomination of swords exploded in a rain of daggers and swords. Spinner would gap in horror at his broken weapon before turning directly into a gut punch that would cause him to double over before a nimble roundhouse would knock him over and onto the ground. Midwaria, where's Koda? Mandalay would yell. He's safe. Mr. Aizawa has him. He wanted me to tell you that it's okay if we fight. He wants you to tell that to everyone. He yelled, dodging back. She would activate her quirk before stating to everyone within her range, attention. Students, if you should run across any villain, you have the permission to fight. Stay safe. Magni would duck a hook aim to take her head off her shoulders before a gut jab and uppercut would lay the large hero out on his back. A grin spanned her large lips as he retrieved her large magnet. Intent on turning Tiger's head into mush she paused and glanced over. A flash of green and Magni was lifted off her feet and sent flying through several trees and into the distant forest. Midoriya looked down at his hand. He had controlled his power enough to not so much as bend any of the distant trees, but had put enough force into it to subdue the woman. Midoriya, Mandalay would yell. He'd glance over, cocking an eyebrow in response. The woman had tears in her eyes as she relayed the information to him. They took him, Bakugo. She said. His eyes widened. What? When? He exclaimed. They snuck around while we were fighting. They took him in ragdoll. She said. Midoriya would look dumbfounded. The dissipating particles of that same portal from the USJ incident had already begun dissipating where Ragdoll had been laying moments before, as well as where he had knocked the magnet villain. His knees buckled as he collapsed. A thought washed over him like a cold wave from the ocean. The villains. They had won. They took back Hugo. Miuo. Deku would bellow, voice fading into the breeze. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? It is. Welcome to Season 2 Part 4 of What If Deku Could Use 100% of One for All. I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. The unfiltered sunlight shined in through the room's open windows, lighting up the shadows that clung desperately to the room's corners but leaving the mood that hung in the air otherwise unbothered. Midoriya sat with his scarred hands resting idly in his lap while, across from him, Aizawa sat with a majority of the class all gathered around the two of them in silence. The green-haired hero looked up to meet Aizawa's hard gaze with his own, emerald hues meeting ebony. Just for a second, the two stared at one another in perfect silence before Midoriya chose that moment to speak. We can't just keep sitting around here and waiting. Someone's got to do something to get back Hugo back. He would exclaim. We will, we just have to figure out what. Reports have already started coming and stating Shigaraki has all for one. He is extremely dangerous. And there's always the chance he could take your quirk, Midoriya. He said, looking at the young boy. He frowned and shook his head vigorously. No, you heard what All Might said. As long as I don't want him to have it he can't take it, no matter what. He exclaimed. I know what he said but you know as well as I do how unpredictable that quirk is, if he were to take one for all. The hero society as a whole would be doomed, he said solemnly. Midoriya stood up, turning before storming out of the room. If no one was going to do anything, he'd have to do something, because if he didn't the world as they know it could possibly change forever. Meanwhile, Shigaraki was a king on a throne, surrounded by the people that saw him seated upon it. Recently twice had received contact from the young head of the Shai Hasaki, a young boy by the name of Overhaul, a relatively tall, slender young man dressed formally in a dress shirt, tie, and fur-collared coat and the red and gold plague doctor's mask that was his trademark. So you're the one who took all for one's power? Huh. The new prince of darkness thought you'd be taller, Overhaul said, staring at him impassively. Shigaraki narrowed his eyes, but otherwise continued to hear the man on. Overhaul looked around at the people around him. Mr. Compress, Toga, Magni, and finally twice, they had lost Moonfish, Muscular, and Spinner in the ensuing conflict in the forest, however their prize sat chained in a nearby chair. The aforementioned atomic blonde sat by the professional hero, and member of the Pussycats, Ragdoll. She was still unconscious, but Bakugo had woken up an hour prior and remained silent, merely glaring at them. 
You know, it wasn't until recently that word got out that All for One was real. Everyone my age thought he was a myth, a legend that died years before All Might decided to throw him into the ocean. Sad really. I'd have liked to meet the man behind all this. Overhaul said, well he isn't and I'm here to take his place now. Shigaraki said bitterly, glaring at the Yakuza frontrunner. I see, and I think right there is where you have an issue. If you have this many people, you need a plan. A goal without a plan after all is only a wish. I'm willing to take you, to take all of you under my wing, and I'll show you how to truly set a plan into motion. Overhaul said brazenly. Magni, agitated by the young frontrunner's forwardness suddenly sprang forward. Work under you. No thanks sweetheart. A friend once told me, you're your own person, never stoop to working under someone, always work with them, or if you can have them work for you. She is a kind and gentle soul, a true saint, and I'll be damned if I work for some poo. Pulling overhaul forward, she brought the magnet she held down atop his head simultaneously as he dragged a single finger down her arm. Suddenly, her flesh would pulse before suddenly bulging at the seams and the woman was suddenly reduced to a chunky mist that filled the room with an explosive splat. Big sis mag, Toga would exclaim, and they all stared on in horror. Reacting immediately, Compress leapt from where he sat but was dwarfed in speed by the much faster Shigaraki. Overhaul's eyes widened as Overhaul raised a hand to defend. Only for Shigaraki to find himself in front of a nameless Yakuza thug who he reduced to dust immediately with a touch. Bursting through the man's ruined body he seized a hold of Overhaul's face and arm and hand. A blue glow emanated from his hands as his golden, bird-like eyes rolled back in his head. Shigaraki had robbed not only Overhaul of his quirk, but his life. The wall behind him burst open to reveal several other Yakuza just as Overhaul was reduced to dust in Shigaraki's hands. Overhaul looked up at the group who stared in horror at the sudden and violent death of their leader. If any of you want to escape the fate of your leader, you'd be good to bow to the next reigning king of darkness, Tamura Shigaraki. I won't be walked on by some obsolete Yakuza, Shigaraki stated. Twice, show the Yakuza where they'll be placed, Shigaraki said, walking across the warehouse. He touched two fingers to the half of Magna's body that laid out on the ground. As suddenly as she had died, she was together again, sitting and staring at her hands in shock and then up at Shigaraki. Toga squealed in delight, dashing across the warehouse before seizing Magni in a tight embrace. Bakugo grit his teeth, before bellowing. Let me out so I can kick your ass you bastard. A sly smile crossed Shigaraki's lips. Slowly he walked past Toga sobbing against Magna's shoulder, approaching the steaming Bakugo who bit and struggled against his restraints. By now Ragdoll had begun to stir, catching Shigaraki's attention for the moment despite Bakugo's screaming. Your quirk interests me, Ragdoll, Shigaraki said. The woman's eyes fluttered slightly, opening to about halfway up before Shigaraki suddenly seized her by the face. Tears ran in thick streams down her face as the same eerie blue glow emanated from his hand and, just like overhaul, her quirk was no more. Her eyes widened before, suddenly, her face would dim and darken to a shade of grey in his palm, cracks splintering the surface of her face into several pieces before her body crumbled away to dust in his hand. You're more useful to me alive than you know, Katsuki. I can finally kill that pesky brat that got me put away and all for one killed, Shigaraki stated. Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive is a channel based on a variety of anime lore. If you are interested in content like this, make sure you click the icon on the top right corner or check the description below for a link to the channel. Now, with that out of the way let's get back into the story. Midoriya had been in the process of pulling on his green hero suit when All Might appeared in his shriveled, emaciated form in the doorway staring at the young, messy green-haired boy with sadness ruminating in his eyes. If I had known that doing that to all for one would have led to this I would have never gone there in the first place, he said, guilt evident in his tone. It's not your fault all might. You did what you thought was right, and I have one for all now, so it's up to me to beat Shigaraki. Deku said, I've got to make this right, Midoriya. If not he'll kill you and the rest of the world, and I can't have that weight on my shoulders. All Might said, frowning. All Might, wait, Midoriya called. By then All Might had turned and walked away, leaving Midoriya in his wake as he quickly exited the dorms before vanishing. Like a puppy running after its master, Midoriya ran after All Might. As he ran he noticed how the tall towers and skyscrapers of Musutafu quickly turned into smaller, older dilapidated houses. Still with no sight of All Might he broke off to the side and ran in between a series of houses that bordered a warehouse that sat still directly in the center of the district. He thought he saw the blonde ends of All Might's hair as he entered a door. Running after him he was only met with an old door. Confused, the young hero wandered around the warehouse before climbing up and taking a seat on the brick wall that stood tall at the side of the warehouse. Peering in through the windows, he barely registered the image of All Might as he entered the building. He looked like he was talking to someone. And who was that someone? Midoriya squinted his eyes and leaned forward. Then he paused, cold. 
It was Shigaraki. All Might stared sadly at Shigaraki as he sat, staring at the broken old man indifferently from his throne, to his right sat Toei, with Compress looming over her and Magni staring daggers at the former symbol of peace while twice sat twiddling his thumbs. Shigaraki averted his eyes from his friends and followers before turning them to stare at All Might. I'm surprised All Might of all people, here. Here to do what? Your power's gone, given to that brat that got me locked away and all for one killed by you. Have you come here to apologize? To beg. Beg for your life, for young Bakugos. Shigaraki questioned. All Might sadly looked over at the atomic blonde who sat, mouth wide in shock at the sight of All Might standing before Shigaraki. Please, Tamura. You know as well as I do Nana wouldn't want this for you, for him, for any of us. I did what I had to do to save you as much as the world. That man was evil. He was grooming you to become him. All Might pleaded. Shigaraki scoffed. Nana was never around. She wasn't there when my dear dad beat me for wanting to become a hero. She was out, being a hero while I sat alone in my room, crying. My power, all for one, they were a gift. He took me in when I had no one. He gave me something I never had growing up. Hope, hope for something beyond what I grew up around. Shigaraki said, all for one killed Nana, Tamira. Did he ever tell you that? She wasn't ever around because he had killed her. She was your grandmother and my mentor. Please T. Shigaraki shot up from his seat with a snarl. Don't patronize me all might. He did what he had to do to protect me, to make me stronger. Now all that stands between me and that power is you, all might. And that brat with your annoying power. Shigaraki said. Stepping forward he grabbed the shriveled man by the throat. He grabbed and clawed at Shigaraki's fingers but it was too late. With a simple flex of his hand All Might's neck jerked to the side with a violent, viscous snap before his body crumbled to dust in his hand. By then Midoriya was sobbing openly, thick, snotty tears running down his cheeks as he had watched his friend, mentor and father figure crumble to dust before his eyes. He screamed, screamed, screamed and screamed some more. Lightning crawled up his skin before, in a single push of his fist, a violent gust of air pressure reduced the warehouse to splinters. Standing amongst the rubble stood the League of Villains, and their leader. A wide smile plastered on his chapped lips. In one hand he held the struggling Bakugo, with the other hand looking dangerously close to the atomic blonde's neck. You took my master away from me. I only thought it fair to take that and a little more from you, Midoriya. Shigaraki said, extending his hand. Much to Midoriya's horror, he watched in silence with tears streaming down his face as he enclosed Bakugo's face in his palm. All five fingers touching down before, suddenly, he erupted in a violent explosion that sent Shigaraki flying and left Bakugo standing there. Don't touch me you freak, Bakugo shouted. Kakin, Midoriya yelled, came sprinting to Bakugo's side just as Shigaraki stood up from the rubble, glaring daggers at the both of them. You'll never hurt Kakin, as long as I live, Midoriya yelled. We'll see about that. Little brother, thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We The Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We The Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day. Hey, what is up, mortals? Season 2 Part 6 of What If Deku Got 100% of One For All I just wanted to greet you guys by just saying, sit back and relax, you're in for a treat. So, we begin. We'll see about that. Little brother, Shigaraki stood in silence, boggled at the remark that had passed from in between his dry, cracked lips. Little brother, his mind brought him back to the same day that his powers originally surfaced. How the dog crumbled in his hands, how his sister's lively skin turned dry, gray and cadaverous before it crumbled into dust like the dog. All around him the house seemed to follow, crumbling, decaying. His mother had tried to flee, running out into the front yard before she even succumbed to the spread of the little boy's decay. It left him with his father as his sole guardian. And even then that bastardous old man stood strong amongst all the destruction to berate the little boy. Even standing before death itself, the insufferable son of a bitch kept going. Berating the young Tamura, berating his deceased grandmother, cursing the heroes, their quirks, and their very society itself. The decay, however, spared the man, curving around him and leaving him in the only spot in the home not currently disintegrating before their eyes. Like a cat, Tamura pounced on the man, grabbing the man's face in a vice-like grip. He screamed and screamed, cried and begged. Slowly the color drained from his skin, his screaming falling short before he too crumbled into nothing in the hands of Tamura Shigaraki. Maybe this quirk had yet some lingering trace of his former master within, some surviving fragment of all for one that was affecting his thoughts. The idea of this made Shigaraki frown in dissatisfaction. In that moment an idea bloomed in his mind. He didn't want to be like all for one. No, he wanted to be better than the man. 
he would reject what lingering a spur of the King of Darkness remained, in turn, become the most feared villain that had ever walked the earth. His frown was soon replaced by a smile so wide his face could barely contain it. He would decay the very foundations of society, and when it all crumbled then he would rebuild upon it and make one ruled solely by him and his most trusted few amongst the League. Would you just shut the hell up and burn already? Dabai's raspy tone snapped Tamura from his thoughts, extending a palm. Blue flame was belched from his palm in a hypnotizing wave of azure blue. The scorching hot flames threw both young heroes immediately into action. Izuku immediately jumped up, while simultaneously Bakugo used his explosions to propel himself up after the young wielder of one for all. Using another blast midair to turn, he used one hand to form a circle with his fingers before the other's palm. Ultimate move, he exclaimed, AP shot, auto cannon. A barrage of explosions rained down atop Dabai and the others, forcing them to scatter. Shigaraki grimaced. In the blink of an eye he was in the air alongside Bakugo. Kakin look out. Izuku bellowed. In a show of crackling green lightning, the young hero appeared beside Bakugo, fist balled and ready to obliterate. Swinging at Shigaraki with all his might an explosion of force practically vaporized the side of the building and sent the young prince of darkness skipping across like ground like a rock on a pound before slamming through several buildings in the distance. A ball of condensed blue flame struck Midoriya, exploding upon impact and sending him flying off into the intact portion of the warehouse's wall, still smoking. Bakugo frowned, turning to look for the source of the flame when a punch to the gut sent him flying into the same wall. Dabai stood, flame gathered in his hand, backed on either side by Spinner, Magni, Toga and Compress. All the while the remainder of the Shai Hasekai stood just behind him. Kendo, Rappa and Tengai have entered the battlefield, the largest of the two standing beside the monk with his fist still smoking from the force behind the impact. I was supposed to be the one to kill him. About that scrawny kid. Rappa complained, causing Tengai to roll his eyes. Now's not the time for your childish antics, Rappa. Make sure the boy is down. He said, Izuku laid, clothing burned and flesh singed. He clenched his fist tight, pain coursing through his burned arms and legs and flooding his nervous system with all kinds of signals. Slowly rising up from the rubble he barely had time to duck a heavy right hook from the large, former, member of the Eight Precepts of Death. The barrage didn't stop there however. The hook was followed by a flurry of blows that left Midoriya bruised and battered, glaring up at the large man in the plague doctor's mask. He struggled to stand before another flurry sent him right back down into the wall where he had landed. This can't be where I die, not now. He mumbled to himself. Young Midoriya, a familiar voice said. The young freckle-faced youth opened his eyes. And before him stood not only All Might, but the other former users of One for All. Each one wore a look of familiarity, each one adorning a smile. I'm sorry that I wasn't around long enough to properly guide you. Especially now, when you need me the most. Now more than ever you need to harness my power, our power, and defeat Shigaraki and save not only our city, but Japan, and the world. Toshinora said, kneeling down to the boy and offering him a hand. He winced, beaten and bloodied, and took his hand. Before we get back into the story, I would like to say that we've got a second channel called Anime Deep Dive. Anime Deep Dive is a channel based on a variety of anime lore. If you are interested in content like this, make sure you click the icon on the top right corner or check the description below for a link to the channel. Now, with that out of the way let's get back into the story. A viscous black energy built up in the palm of his hand and, in a flash, a black whip of energy suddenly wrapped both of the brawler's large fists. Rappa grunted in confusion, glancing back down at Izuku before a 25% uppercut sent the large brawler airborne. Rising up from the rubble, green electricity burned hot in his eyes before he immediately went from a 25% punch to an 85% punch. The air pressure change reduced Tengai's barrier to shards and sending not only him, but the entire Shai Hasekai and the League careening off into the distance. All for one, Delaware Texas smash. He bellowed, his knees buckled slightly. He tiredly looked over to where Katsuki had landed and found his friend struggling to stand with what he suspected were several broken ribs. Offering the atomic blonde a helping hand he took it with some added spice. Standing with Midoriya's help. I didn't need any of her help you damn nerd. He spat. Ignoring him, he looked down at the black whip that had materialized in his hand. Was this what All Might meant? He thought to himself. He looked up as the approaching sounds of sirens came and along with it an influx of other heroes, with their teacher leading the charge. As sorry Mr. Aizawa, Izuku said breathlessly, smiling bashfully. He opened his mouth to speak, before a sudden condensed blast of air tore through not only the hero crust, who stood at his side, but his back and stomach, splattering both the ground in front of Izuku with viscera and entrails but also catching the entire hero congregation by surprise. Conflict ensued as, left and right, heroes were reduced to blood or merely ripped apart as something akin to a raging bull came charging from where Izuku had sent him flying moments earlier. 
You thought you'd win this. Izuku Midoriya. Shigaraki bellowed over the death throes of heroes. The bloodied eraser head looked up at the green and blonde-haired boys. Rue. Shigaraki planted a foot on the ebony-haired man's back, cutting him off mid-sentence as he crumbled into dust on the ground before them, leaving the two young heroes standing breathlessly before the massacred remains of heroes and police alike. Bakugo bit back his rage, but before he could blast himself forward a wall of bright blue flame slammed into him, scorching him and throwing him back into the wall. You thought you could get rid of us that easily? Thanks for the help, twice. Dabai rasped, offering his teammate a nod of approval. Anything I could do to help. Anything to watch these boys suffer. He responded. You. You won't win this you bastard. The wall. And everything behind it was vaporized behind the force of Bakugo's explosion as he launched himself like a bullet at Shigaraki, flying through the flames and ignoring the burns as he threw out a hand. Howitzer. Impah. He grunted as Shigaraki dashed forward to meet him, activating air cannon simultaneously as he slammed a balled-up fist into the young atomic blonde's gut, blowing a hole through him so clean that Midoriya could see Shigaraki from the other side. Crimson flew from the blonde's mouth, before Shigaraki clamped a hand over his face, draining him of his quirk within seconds. The heroes aren't going to win this time. Shigaraki hissed. Izuku watched in horror as his friend decayed before his eyes, crumbling into dust within the grasp of the new Prince of Darkness. Materializing his black whip, he threw it out and wrapped Shigaraki's right arm, pulling him forward and directly into a 100% jab that entirely flayed the skin off the right side of his face. However, it regenerated moments later and he gave the young hero the same punch back threefold, sending him flying across the battlefield and into the opposing wall. Dabai, I need you. Shigaraki spat. The black-haired pyrokinetic waltzed up to meet him at his side. Shigaraki turned before grasping his shoulder. I need your power to help kill this insolent brat. He won't die as easily as I thought. He said. Dabai offered him an odd smile. Before suddenly the two of them merged, thanks to the quirk taken from overhaul. The two of them screamed in agony as their flesh, bones, and quirks merged into a four-armed abomination that resembled Shigaraki but with the features of Dabai. The newly mutated Prince of Darkness grinned at the flame that sparked to life in each four of his palms. Turning he sent a proverbial tidal wave of flame across the warehouse, melting not only the back wall, but several miles of both buildings and people behind it. The crackle of lightning behind him however confirmed that Deku, however an annoyance, had yet to perish. One for all. 300%. Smash. A flurry of energized punches ripped and tore chunks from Shigaraki's mutated form, removing limbs which seemed to piece themselves back on moments later. Discouraged, but not beaten, Midoriya continued hammering away at his foe's mutated form until both fists were suddenly stopped by Shigaraki's two bottom hands while the other two belched flames directly into Izuku's pale face, scorching his flesh as well as his eyes and blackening the world he knew into darkness. A double-fisted jab sent the boy careening off into the rubble ahead of him. Bloodied, burned, battered, and blind he continued to stand yet again on legs that barely supported him. Why won't you just die? Shigaraki yelled, grabbing not only Rappa with one hand, but Magni too. The two of them merged with Shigaraki's already warped form. Rappa protested and fought, but Shigaraki was stronger and before the green-haired boy's eyes stood the newly warped Shigaraki, standing at twelve feet in height and with now eight arms and several dozens of quirks at his disposal. All for one. Unlimited percent. United States, Japan, and the world. Shigaraki's eyes widened as Deku's body suddenly began emitting a bright green glow, so bright he had to shield his eyes from its intensity. Smash. Dashing forward at a speed in which he couldn't even comprehend. His fist impacted Shigaraki's face with an explosion of force so great that it'd appear from orbit that a bomb had perhaps been dropped on Japan. Burning up in the wave of energy, Shigaraki screamed out in rage as he, as well as half of the city, the League, and the Shai Hasekai were reduced to atoms in the following wave of energy. He collapsed to his knees, clutching at the remains of his now missing right arm and shoulder. His body was burned and broken, but he continued to look on with hope in his fading green eyes. At the welcoming arms of All Might as he and the others beckoned him with warm embraces. He had won. Thank you all for sticking around and I hope that you enjoyed. Before you leave we would just like to let you know that We the Celestials has many other channels for your entertainment and viewing purposes. All the information you'll need is right below here in the description, so feel free to check out all the other incredible projects our team creates. Secondly, on behalf of We the Celestials, I'd like to thank everyone involved in the production of today's awesome content. Their details will be in the description below. That's all for today's video, so goodbye and have a divine day.